Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Aha. Are we there yet? The numbers are climbing up. We have 160 right now, 61, 162. Very good. Good. Right, a, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are. Uh, this webinar will begin shortly. All participants uh, and audiences' microphones are muted. If you have any questions, please type it in the questions box or on your control panel. Uh, please do wait for us while we uh, will be starting uh, in a short, uh, in, in a in a moment time. William, your daughter passed by to say hello. It's No, it's okay, but it's eleven o'clock at night. Say, Daddy, you need to put me to bed. <laughs> you, 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 she's, I'm the, you, she's, I'm the one with the the, the, the cane, uh, to to ask him to go to sleep. So, so yeah, but not for tonight. Not for tonight. <laughs> you see, the, your dedication, William, is remarkable. Thank you so much. Oh, oh no, oh, no, 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 And we've got the early the early bird uh, cats there, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> hey, lovely. Right, uh, if, if you if you all do mind, I'll just um start with some housekeeping rules. Uh, welcome to all our, our audience, our, our attendees, some instructions for good experience. Um from this is a go to webinar panel. Uh, you will find uh, the number one tier that refers to the orange um, arrow. The or orange arrow will open and closes your uh, closed control panel. Uh, you can also uh, change the audio options uh, to computer or phones if you are joining us via the phones over here. Uh, however, all uh, attendees' microphones are by default muted. If you like to ask questions, please go to the questions box and type in the questions to ask our presenters. Uh, at the end of the session, if you have time, we will have you have time for Q and A. Then our moderators will then address all, all your questions. Uh, these sessions will be recorded and will be shared uh, with everyone. Uh, every participants will receive the post webinar emails along with the attendance certificates and video link. Uh, within 24 hours uh, after the uh, webinar today. It's just a simple uh, housekeeping route. Uh, with that, I would pass the floor to Dr. CC. Uh, hold on, Dr. CC. I'm sending the request to uh, you right now. Right. Do, do, do remember to select the uh, screen too. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. Good. I can't see it myself. It's it's awkward. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar. And uh, I would like to um, first ask uh, Professor Dimitros, um, the editor in chief, to start the webinar for us. Thank you so much. Let me say blessings and let me say how wonderful it is to see so many people. 687 people have registered for this and uh, there are people from all over the world uh, and uh, many people are in Asian and Australian uh, timeline, so it's quite late. I really like to thank uh, uh, Gary and William for their dedication. It's midnight in Malaysia and they're managing everything from the other end of the world. As you as you would remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do four webinars per year, and two of them will be on uh, US, Europe uh, friendly times, and uh, two of them will be in Asia, Australia friendly times. So we can spread the love around the world. It's uh, It has been fantastic to see so many colleagues and I really like to thank uh, Tete and Daisy and, uh, and Gary for organizing all that. And also I would like to thank our panel for joining us, Michelle, David, Yuli, Benny, and then Alan is gonna turn up at some stage uh, as soon as he's uh, finished a couple of things. So 
Um, the purpose of this is to make sure that um, everybody understands what we are doing in tourism review. They understand the system, they understand the process, they understand what we're trying to achieve. So they are more successful on uh, when they're sending their papers. Currently, Tourism Review is doing extremely well. We are, uh, last year we got almost 1,000 uh, manuscripts coming through. And uh, uh, this is uh, creating quite a lot of work for everybody on the editorial board who is really dedicated to uh, make sure that the best research is getting published. Uh, the more people understand what's the requirement and how we can uh, engage in science uh, from around the world, the more uh, successful they are. Currently, um, Tourism Review is publishing about 10% of the papers we receive. So uh, in 2024, we'll publish 90 papers in nine issues. And in 2025, we will be 80 years old. I will be a very old lady. Uh, and we will uh, celebrate that with increasing to 100 papers in 10 issues. So we've been very, very busy on expanding. On the slides that you see currently, you see that uh, we had a, an impact factor in 22, that's uh, 7.8. Um, I'm crossing my fingers, but in uh, 2023, the impact, the 2023 impact factor will be something like 9.5. We are kind of, this is the prediction we've got, and we are approaching the 10. Um, um, I've got, I've got a, a target for 10, really. I think uh, if we've got uh, an impact factor of 10, I'll be a little bit more relaxed in the future. Uh, the side score in March 2023 was 14.9. So you can see that the journal is uh, widely read and is widely used everywhere. Let's get the next slide. So you can see the downloads and you can see how it's increasing year on year. And you see how um, more people are reading the journal, so I'm glad that you're here. So you can read the journal, you can uh, you can uh, prescribe the journal to your students, and make sure that that uh, that that you're using the best research that we're publishing. Um, inevitably, bigger countries are using uh, the journal more. So in uh, China, most of our downloads are coming from China. And then the UK, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, United States, Germany, Thailand, and, and Spain. And uh, what you can see is that uh, how many uh, uh, downloads we've got on the special issue. It's an opportunity actually to explain that, that most of the issues in Tourism Review are actually curated. So we don't do special issues but we do curated issues. So most of them, they're coming into different themes. Uh, normally on, uh, on the first issue every year, we're doing a special issue, but, but it's, it's one of very, very topical topics that we do. And, and we only have our associate editors who are taking care of that. And Tete and, and Daisy and some other colleagues have, have been very dedicated into developing one of those. On the next slide, you will see um, how the impact factors and the citations are increasing every year. And, and of course, this is something that I'm looking uh, very carefully to see how many, uh, what, what is, the, what is the, the, the topics that people would like to read and what the, the big issues that they are and what are the big trends. So we, we support uh, the community by addressing the big trends. And the next topic? So again, you see how many articles we're publishing uh, per year. You remember that when we started in 2017, when I started as an editor, we are publishing uh, about 20 articles per year. Uh, in 2023, we published uh, 83. In, in uh, 2024, we will publish 90, and 2025, we'll publish 100. And you can see the institutions where uh, most of the papers are coming from. So it's Sichuan University in China, 
University of Central Florida, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, uh, Hong Kiao, if I pronounce it right, and Nankai University. And you can see some of the top, uh, you can see some of the top uh, contributors to the journal. Uh, this is um, papers accepted, and the and the you can see the top universities that they are submitting papers from Sichuan, Nankai, Hainan, uh, the university, the City University of Macau, Hunkiao University, the University of Tehran, Beijing International uh, Studies University, Zhejiang, San, San Yansen, and the University of Kashmir, uh, and you can see where the um, the top organizations for accepted papers is Sichuan University, Hainan Universities in China, then the University of Central Florida. I think Benny and her colleagues are doing a, a good job with that. Then you have got Huangkao University and Taiya, National Taiya uh, University in Taiwan, you've got Nankai in uh, China, you've got Kanhe University in Korea, San Yansen and um, the National Kaoching University from Taiwan and the University of Malaga, I think is the last one in the list from Spain. We really want to spread around um, the authors and the papers that are coming through. So we're quite keen to get uh, papers from uh, Europe and from the United States and, and America in general. And the next slide. And welcome to this webinar. And the purpose of the webinar is really to make sure that everybody understands how the process works and how they can do better papers. And I will leave that with Chet and Daisy to actually introduce our guests and um, to have the conversation. Please make sure that we are receiving your questions so we can answer everything and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Chet, over to you. Thank you, uh, Professor Boharis, uh, for a wonderful uh, introduction of the journal. And I'll pass it over to Daisy, who will introduce our panelists of today. Thanks, Yusian Dimitris. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce all our speakers today. Uh, before our talk, um, I will have a brief uh, instruction for this uh, uh, structure. Uh, after my introduction, each of our speaker will have around 10 minutes to talk about their own chapters and topics. And then we will open the floor for the uh, Q&A. CC will also coordinate with the questions and also to now assign speakers to answer. Uh, I think that's the overall agenda. Um, before this, please allow me to introduce each of our speakers and panelists. Uh, we try our best to shorten it and to make it as brief as possible. But as we know, each of the speakers, they have a much more to say. So sorry for the time limit. Uh, the first speaker for today is Professor David Fennell. He is a professor in the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies at Brock University, Canada. David teaches and researches in the area of tourism and animal ethics, ecotourism, tourism ethics, and the sustainable tourism. He has written leading books on these topics, including tourism and animal ethics, ecotourism, and tourism ethics. A major threat of his research involved theory from other disciplines to gain traction on many of tourism's most persistent problems. He is founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Ecotourism and a global top 2% scholar based on citations. Okay, thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Alan File. He is uh, Associate Dean Academic Affairs and visiting Orlando Indoor Chair of Tourism Marketing at the UCF Rosen College of Hospitality Management. Alan serves on the advisory board of uh, Travel Ability, is funding editor of the Journal of Destination Marketing and Management, and elected fellow of the International Academy for the Study of Tourism. Alan's recent work focuses on sustainable resilience and a more inclusive, accessible destination development. He's serving as one of the leading authors of the Ocean Panel publication, opportunities for transforming coastal and marine tourism towards sustainability, regeneration, and resilience. And Dr. Yulik 
uh, Grisel is a senior fellow at the Center for Public Relations, University of Southern Car uh, California, and a director of research at Netnographer Africa. Her research spans the design, use, and implications of emerging technologies, ranging from social media and the mobile applications to smart cities, robots, and the metaverse. She has over 20 years of experience conducting academic and practice-focused research. She is frequently acknowledged as one of the most cited authors in the fields of tourism and persuasion, and is an elected fellow of the International Academy for the Study of Tourism. Next, Dr. Michelle Blount is a senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Jamaica. Her tourism industry experience spans over 30 years, and she received her PhD from Bournemouth University. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. McLaws, a forthcoming book entitled Island Tourism Policy and Sustainable Development is the first of its kind about island tourism policy, governments, and sustainability. Dr. McLaws served a three co edited book uh, entitled Knowledge Networks and Tourism tourism management in warm water islands destinations and islands tourism sustainability and resiliency. Her present research interests are in the subject area of tourism development, islands tourism, service productivity, knowledge networks, and policy networks. Dr. Bandiku Okmush is a social professor at the UCF Rosen College of Hospitality Management. Her primary teaching areas include nutrition concepts and issues in food services, international cuisine and culture, and sensitization uh, in the food service industry, and health and wellness in hospitality and tourism. Her research focuses on food safety, eating behavior and eating habits, food and culinary tourism, food waste and health well-being in hospitality and tourism. Dr. Okumush has worked in multidisciplinary research teams and secured and completed research grants. She has authored, co-authored numerous of academic journal articles, conference presentations, books, and book chapters. Um, last, Dr. Craig Webster is a social professor of hospitality innovation and the leadership in the Department of Applied Business Studies at Ball State University, USA. He has taught at uh, Bingham, uh, Binghamton University's Chica uh, College, the College of Tourism and Hotel Management in Nicosia and the University of Nicosia. His research interests include the political economy of tourism, service automation in service industries, public opinions analytics, and the fringe events. Dr. Webster has published in many peer-reviewed journals and is the co-editor of three books. He is currently the Tragedies of Central Cree. Um, welcome, everyone. So uh, may I pass the floor to uh, David for the first presentation, please? Great. Um... Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. And I have to say that uh, this is a great idea. Um, I know throughout my career, I've struggled, um, you know, to, to try to piece everything together uh, for what I would think to be a, a, a great or a good or an accepted publication. Um, as a graduate student and as a young scholar, so it's taken me many years to come up with a recipe what, or what I think is, is the appropriate um, style and approach to writing a paper. So I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you about originality and, and introduction. So next slide, please. So originality, um, adding new knowledge to the knowledge that currently exists in the field is very, very important. And I've had the benefit, uh, you know, as a graduate student, we had five journals in the library. There was just five journals out at the time. So I know we've come a very, very long way. And uh, I'm really impressed with the originality that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing throughout the years. And I think it, even as we get larger and larger, it becomes even that much more important to stay original 
in uh, how we approach our research. So we have to be innovative and creative in, in new knowledge to move our field forward. And I, you know, we see it in sustainability, we see it in justice and poverty and inclusivity, and a whole range of different um, themes and topics that we now have in the tourism field. So um, originality becomes very important for these new topics as well as some of the existing ones as well. So next slide, please. Um, and for me, I've, I've always tried to anticipate where the field is going in, you know, some sort of distance down the road, whether it's five or 10 years, try to stay ahead of the crowd. And that's really what originality has, has meant to me. So this helped me uh, in the beginning stages of ecotourism in the 1980s. And then I'd go to conferences and people would say, well, ecotourism is the most ethical form of tourism, isn't it, David? And I would say, well, intuitively, intuitively, yes, it is. But at that point in time, in the early 1990s, we didn't really have much in the way of tourism ethics. So I was trying to pivot into tourism ethics at that point in time. And then shortly thereafter, there was virtually nothing in the year 2000. There was nothing on tourism, animals, and ethics. So that was something that I thought was very important, would provide some sort of a link back to ecotourism. So that's really what originality has meant to me, is trying to be at the front of some of these new subfields that we're developing in tourism. And so, you know, I know citations are very important in this day and age, um, but when we get into new topics, it's almost a bit of a sacrifice um, for, in terms of citations for these, for this long-term gain. And I think it, for me, it's been, it's important to sacrifice those citations to start opening up soon some new avenues of research for, um, for, for, both young scholars and existing scholars. And I love this quote, most forward thinking people have their heads turned sideways. This is really what originality means to me. We have to have our heads turned sideways to open up these new avenues for new research. Okay, next slide. And so we use theory from other social scientists. There's no question about that. You know, you know the be beginnings of, of tourism studies field um, uh, have you know, gone through geography and anthropology and economics and psychology and such. That's really important. But for me, what's worked is, is you know, I'll put this in air quotes, is mining theory from disciplines like philosophy and biology to better inform tourism studies. So, you know, the question that you have to ask yourself is either a young scholar or an existing scholar, should we be slavish, you know, slavish to the traditions of our supervisors and our programs, or should we strike out on our own? And for me, um, I had the benefit of having some fantastic supervisors in the past, but for me, you, you know, the, the modus operandi has been to strike out on my own to find these new theories and approaches in sort of non-traditional disciplines that we have in tourism. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Okay, next slide. So here's the theory of reciprocal altruism. I won't spend too much time on this. This is a social bi sociobiological theory. It's a, sorry, it's a, it's a biological study of, the, again, the social behavior of, of animals. And Ed E.O. E. Wilson was a, you know, foundational in this. But, you know, let me just take a little bit of a side trip here. So if humans evolved in small, stable, dependent communities. Um, and so we learned to cooperate. This is a theory, reciprocal altruism is a theory of I scratch your back, you scratch my back. And it's a meta theory. It applies not only in biology, but in every social science, right? So it's absolutely foundational. So we, we learn to cooperate through repeated interaction over time. And time is the key here. Right, so we are the product, humans, as the same selective pressures as other animals. So we've learned to be reciprocal. I do something nice for you, you do something nice for me, and we're altruistic. And uh, uh, you know, at a cost to me, I allow somebody else to benefit. So this is the essence of the theory of recipro reciprocal altruism. So next slide, please. So while we continue to focus on on impacts in tourism, social, cultural, ecological, and economic impacts, I think that's kind of a reactive way of looking at the world. Ethics provides us with more of a proactive way of looking at the world, and, and really reciprocal altruism is a foundation of ethics. So, you know, I think we have problems in tourism. So if, if reciprocal altruism is a form of cooperation based on mutual benefit over time, cooperation and trust should not take place in tourism. We just don't have the time to build those cooperative relationships between people. So no time to build cooperation. There's no shadow of the future, right? And so you know, we're at a destination and then we move off. It sort of opens the door to be cheated, right? Um, and cheating is a failure to reciprocate. So there's a really good example of a, of a discipline in biology 
right? And a theory that comes from biology that we can drag into tourism from an originality context to see if we can change the narrative of what, of what these impacts really mean in tourism. So I think it's a lot deeper than what we traditionally study in the field of, or the, yeah, the field of tourism. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so that's originality, and then uh, I'm not going to spend too much more time, but let's do a little bit of a focus on introduction. Uh, introduction. So there's a real tendency a tendency to be to be too long and too amorphous, you know. And I've, I once again I've written two and three page introductions that you know when I look at it now I've got the review back, you know the referees have really questioned what I've I've just been I've been wandering all over the place I haven't really had that that compass or that map to explain how this needs um, to take place, right? So really for me, it's been three paragraphs of approximately 200 words each, right? So the first would be to review the state of the art of the topic. So in, in one of my research areas like ecotourism or animal ethics is to examine what's taking place out there, what's state of the art, and how is it that we're gonna fill some gaps and move the agenda forward? So that's the first one. Let's go to the next slide. The second one is to, and this becomes very important as the editor in chief of the Journal of Ecotourism, I'm really looking for this stuff in a paper. I want to know what's missing either conceptually, and I love conceptual papers, methodologically, you know, how is it that we're making a difference with the method, methods that we're using, empirically and or theoretically, and absolutely a theory is so important in this. So what's missing, or how is it that we're going to either replicate or push forward from a theoretical standpoint, um, the, the what's important within this subfield or with this topic within this subfield, okay? So we really need to see what sort of theory that you're using or conceptual approach, um, and that is a real trigger for me to say, okay, this is a paper that, that's worthwhile reading. And the third is, is how the article will close the knowledge gap here, okay? So this includes our aims and objectives, and the other thing, please don't forget is, and I've seen this in a number of papers that I've received back after reviews is, where are the definitions of key terms, right? We need to have that. You don't have to define everything, but if the paper is, for example, on animal welfare, what, how is it that we're defining animal welfare so that it puts the reader in the perspective of knowing what's to follow, okay? So it's very important to find those key terms. And then to avoid uh, providing basic or generic statements on the topic, the reader needs to know why your research is novel or original. Um, and so that, once again, puts your paper in a very good position to, you know, not be desk rejected, but to be sent out to, to referees, okay? So those three things become very important in terms of setting this up properly. Okay, next slide. And then, so for me, so here's an example. I do some work on sled dog, tour, uh, sled dog tourism. You know, I think it, what's what's been valuable for me is that I think our research needs to be applied. Absolutely, we need to have the theory in our papers, but we need to have, we need to, like tourism is an applied field. We need to show that there's some sort of an applied link to what we're doing from a theoretical standpoint. So for me, it's been very effective to, for example, use examples from the web or on news on, on specific issues. And that really has been effective in grounding the research into some sort of a practical domain. All right, so yeah, this is an applied context, and I think it's very important for us to make those theoretical and applied connections, all right? And so, yeah, our research really should have some application to the real world, right? So I love to see that in the papers that come by my desk for the Journal of Ecotourism. Okay, and um, I think it's gonna be one of the last slides that's come, up. and just a little bit on the abstract, right? Just to make a clear and concise statement on the bodies, or on the paper's novelty and how it fills that gap, Make sure you include what the theoretical contribution is going to be to the paper. That becomes very important. Include a general statement on the methods used and then a little bit on some of the, the, the findings of the paper. It's always important to put some general findings in there. You don't have to go to a certain or an extensive length in, in terms of putting what that is. What are the main findings that you know, we expect to see by uh, reading the paper? Okay, and I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next, uh, Dr. Benny Okumas will talk about the literature review. We cannot hear you, Benny. You are mute.
You, okay, how about now? Perfect. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Please accept my apologies for my voice. I have been suffering from hoarseness and sore throat for about one week. And I hope my voice does not bother you too much. Uh, my name is Bendik Lokumus. You can call me Benny. I'm a faculty member at Rosen College and Hospitality Management. Uh, my background is science, but I am doing social science research right now and basically on food, uh, health and wellness related topics. Next slide, please. I am assigned to talk about literature review. You know, this topic, it's, it's a little bit tricky for me because I'm coming from uh, science and in science, we barely use literature review. So my transition from science to social science was very difficult because of literature review. And today, by luck, I'm assigned to talk about literature review. Okay, what is literature review? It's all genetic, uh, generic information. You can find this uh, type of information in all type of research methodology books. It's basically an overview of current knowledge. What are what are we doing uh, about literature review? In this section, we generally dig uh, the all literature based on our topic. We are talking about our theory, theory or theories. We are talking about our hypothesis, and we are talking about the uh, supportive, uh, relevant literature about the uh, hypothesis. Next slide, please. There is some differences between uh, science, natural science, and social science uh, literature review process. In so social science, literature review is long, and we really deeply analyze all literature pages and pages in science. Uh, it's opposite. We mostly don't uh, deep down to literature. We are briefly talk about the previous research, and then we generally talk about our methods very deeply. Next slide, please. For a good literature review, uh, you can do some, uh, you can follow some steps. For me, the most important step is critical reading because uh, relevant uh, literature is very important for the literature review. Some researchers use open access uh, research, some researchers use um, a website, some researchers use other uh, literature or uh, references for their articles, but most important thing, I think the critical reading of relevant uh, literature, which is very important because you are going to shape your paper based on this critical reading and based on this relevant, mostly SSCI published journals. Next slide, please. Some researchers uh, follow these steps uh, uh, when they uh, uh, write the literature review, for example, chronological approach. Some of them follow thematic approach, some of them follow methodological approach. I mostly, as a researcher, I mostly follow methodological approach, but these approaches are changeable based on what type of research you are conducting or what type of re uh, research paper you are writing. Next one, please. Uh, differences between social science and natural science. My background is in nutrition and food science. And I can see the differences uh, between social science and uh, uh, natural science very, you know, uh, openly. In social science, um, we generally measure um, uh, less accurate data, unfortunately. For example, we are measuring people's happiness. People can be happy today, but cannot be happy tomorrow on some certain topic. In social science, natural science, uh, on the other hand, we are measuring air, we are working on solid data. So I think uh, natural science is more accurate than uh, social science data because social, in social science, um, you can play the data whenever you want, which is not very good for the social science research. But in science research, you are going to the lab 
and or you are observing the or you are going to the field observing the some certain cases and then write down as a, a paper so social science research and natural science research is a little bit different from each other next slide please I put three different paper here uh, to show the differences between social science and the natural science, specifically in terms of literature review part. For example, in this paper, this is a medical science from medical science, and it's about the cancer re uh, cancer cells research. So this is published. This research is published in a top tier medical journal. It's a total two or three pages. But it's uh, it's a full research paper. If you look at this paper, you can see the summary part, which is abstract for us, an introduction part, and then results. There is no literature review. There is no methodology. They just do the lab research and then put or uh, uh, show us the results openly. But the results section is very long, three page, two pages. So in this inter introduction se section, you can see the aim of the or purpose of the paper. And you can see some literature, one or two literature, and you can see what's, uh, what type of methodology the researcher conducted. So it's a very short but very clear paper. When you read the paper, you can understand what's going on. The second, please. And this uh, research is about childhood obesity. It's a science paper. Again, it's published in a uh, uh, top tier journal. It's a full pa uh, research paper, full research. It's not a brief research. So in this research as well, you can see only introduction and then methodology. There's no literature review. Literature review is blending or merged with the introduction section. So when you read this paper, you can understand What's the aim of the paper? What's the literature, previous literature, or what is the, uh, you know, what type of research the, uh, the researcher conducted? The third one, this is uh, about a food waste paper. It's uh, published in top tier hospitality and tourism journal. Don't worry, I, I'm not gonna criticize anybody's uh, paper. This is my paper, so I can criticize really. <laughs> comfortably. It's a food waste paper. We, uh, as researchers, we wrote abstract and then introduction section. Introduction section, almost one and a half pages. It was very long for me, but my co-workers, uh, co-writers, they were very happy. Uh, for me, introduction section is, was very, very long. Uh, we, I mean, in generally in hospitality and tourism journals, we provide a lot of unnecessary information or stories to readers and we generally repeat ourselves or the previous literature introduction section and in the literature section. Next slide please. This is the second part. We talked about our theory. Theory is very long. Theory section is very long. A lot of story here again. The third one, please. The next slide, please. And then we <laughs> show our research model. And again, we uh, propose our hypothesis and a lot of explanation and literature or, you know, Summary about the literature, critical review about the literature on the literature in this paper, uh, in this uh, page. Next slide, please. And then literature is the review is continue. We uh, uh, analyze the previous literature here. So full four papers, uh, four pages of literature review. Uh, we wrote it's a very deep down literature review and then um, methodology section and then results section and then uh, uh, discussion implications total pages uh, 13 14 pages or more than 10,000 words to explain what's the issue the food waste issue in the restaurants so my question is always I, I'm debating with, with my uh, team members, do we need to write two long papers for 
explaining or for uh, conducting research or for writing our results. It's too much story uh, and it's too much repetitive sentences or repetitive, uh, um, you know, uh, theories or perceptions in these papers. So I think uh, as a researcher, uh, as a reviewer or as an associate uh, editor in a business journal, we need to keep a little bit short our, uh, our research paper, specifically in literature review section, because uh, our uh, research papers are not only uh, read, read, read by the academicians, uh, industry professionals are also reading our uh, academic papers. And most of the time they find our papers very long and very boring. So we can focus more than literature review, long literature review. We can focus on methods and discussion conclusion parts, which is very important. If you write a paper more than 10,000 words, and then if you say food, food waste is very uh, big issue for the restaurant, it's not a good research for me. So instead of focusing more long introduction, long literature review uh, sections, we can focus on the uh, methodology and we can focus on results and discussions which may our uh, research papers more appeal and readable for others, for other academicians and for other industry professions. Next, please. Uh, when scanning the literature, you should pay attention to these questions. Uh, this is again in generic information. You can find it all, all type of research methodology books. Uh, what are the important sources? What is the main problem? What are the perspectives? What is the origin and definition of the problem? What are the important theories, concepts, and views? Uh, what is its epistemological and uh, ontological basis? How is the knowledge about the subject organized? What is the question that is not research and asked? Next, please. Yes, this is my part. Thank you so much. If you have any question and uh, questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. And great. Uh, I think it's a great question to throw out for the whole uh, discipline to think about our literature and the introduction, whether we need such a long intro introduction and literature. I think both David and you are agreed on we need something shorter and more to the point. Thank you very much. And then next, uh, uh, Doctor, let's welcome Dr. Michelle uh, McClay to explain the methodology part of that work paper. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm here in the beautiful island of Jamaica and welcome to the Tourism Review uh, webinar, writing high uh, quality papers. I want to thank um, Dimitrio, Cece, and Daisy um, for inviting me to join this uh, webinar. And I, I must say, when I looked at it, uh, it's going to be a, a very simple uh, presentation because methodology could be something mind boggling. And uh, if, in fact, your paper the, the issues with the methodology, then um, it will not be uh, published. Uh, so it's very important that you get this section right. So I, I always start when I uh, do uh, the writing uh, type workshops uh, with this uh, point. What are some of the things that prevent you from writing? And I'm going to take one minute, which is 60 seconds, and ask you just to write down, it could be on your phone, pen and paper, what are some of the things that are preventing you from writing? So I'm going to just count 60 seconds now.
Okay, so when you look at what you have written down, and let's look at the next slide, CC, and see if some of these positive, powerful affirmations can help you through that writing process. What about first drafts don't have to be perfect, they just have to be written. Rhea Wellingham. If you don't write it, it will never be written. Uh, Shoana Payne Gold. Just write a crappy draft. That is my favorite one. <laughs> Francine Glazer. And first you make a mess, then you clean it up. Chine Osuji. And I just want to encourage everyone that as a writer, yes, it is a task, but it is a task that can be done very well. You just need to get going and get started. What is the purpose of the methodology? And I just want to uh, reference Coates' work, 2007, about writing uh, your first quantitative paper. And it's basically a systematic description of what you've done. But the part that most writers and authors and researchers forget about, it must also be a justification of why you would have embarked on those methods. So while we see um, step by step all the activities involved in the methods, uh, we don't see the justification why you did a quantitative as opposed to a qualitative, why you use a particular sampling or survey method. And so it's very important um, that you also look at the justification for the methods. Uh, basically, um, there are three main uh, subsections, and you would think as researchers that we would have this um, systematically at the forefront. Um, but in later on, and some of the issues that I would talk about that I've seen as a reviewer um, really uh, means that perhaps as authors, we need to ensure that uh, when we're writing the methodology section, we have some kind of checklist or guideline. Uh, the first aspect of the methodology that will need to be written is the actual research design. Uh, how did the study um, methods fit together in that design? And as part of that um, design would be the entire um, selection of the sample population, um, of the target population, sorry, and then the sampling method. How do you intend? Because most of our research would not involve a census activity. There is some sampling, and sampling involves a design, and it must be a design that will answer whatever the research problem, the research questions that you uh, would have uh, decided, the aim and objectives you are trying to achieve. Um, the second is the data collection, and sometimes the data comes out uh, at the forefront without any plan or design um, when the author or researcher is writing it up. Um, so the design comes first, data collection, and data collection would have all the measurement matters included. Um, so your research instrument, and uh, believe it or not, sometimes there are no details at all about what it is, the instrument that was actually used. Uh, we see the results, but there is no idea of the research instrument. And there are different types of data. Um, so uh, in, in terms of um, the type of data, if you're using Likert scales or quantitative, uh, as opposed to um, various types of categorical. So like a case of ordinal, you have categorical. What are the measurements that you would need to conduct in order to gather this data? And uh, that has to be carefully considered. It has to be carefully justified. And um, so researchers, authors need to pay attention 
um, to that data collection uh, process and reporting on it. Then next, the data analysis. And sometimes this is left out. Um, so I have seen papers just focusing on the data collection, no um, design, no data analysis. And, and sometimes the analysis goes along with the results. I think it would be um, because you are justifying the methods that you've used when writing up the methodology that you also talk about um, the data analysis, including the types of tests um, that would need to be done to answer um, the research questions to achieve your research aim and objectives. Uh, so the data analysis section is extremely important. Uh, if there are particular formulas or equations uh, that uh, would uh, it's involved, then that would need um, to really be detailed as, as to the analysis of the data. And some of the methodological uh, mistakes, and I really want to, to go through, I mean, this uh, sort of, you know, basic statistics and so on, as tourism researchers and social scientists, uh, we need to really understand uh, some of these uh, matters because we are doing measurements and we need to ensure that the data is accurate. So um, some of the popular ones, um, there are sampling errors, there are population specification errors, um, and even looking at things like inclusion and exclusion criteria in selecting the population selection errors, um, non-response errors, measurement errors, questionnaire issues, um, processing errors. So there can be a number of areas. And if uh, uh, the data that you have, um, if the design uh, to begin with, there were issues there, then you would end up with a number of these uh, mistakes. So that's why the design process is very critical to address these issues. Um, so some of the um, solutions to consider uh, would it include increased sample size, in, including qualitative. More and more, I am seeing less and less persons being um, included in qualitative um, studies. Uh, so uh, that has to be carefully um, considered, uh, particularly uh, for both qualitative and quantitative. Um, studies. Defining the relevant um, target population. Uh, as an example, if, if on an island you want to measure the use of uh, water um, by tourists and you have both land-based visitors and you have cruise visitors, if you're just selecting um, land-based visitors and leaving out the cruise visitors, you're not actually measuring um, accurately. So it's those kinds of matters that would need to be carefully um, worked out. Um, setting inclusion and exclusion criteria, having appropriate survey methods, uh, whether it's online or in-person telephone, the, the advantages and disadvantages. And that will affect non-response uh, matters as well. So it has to fit together, the alignment of all these matters resolving um, the methodological mistakes. That's why designing um, the, the, the research study in the first place is extremely um, important. Um, pilot studies, many times um, in reviewing papers, there is no mention of any kind of pre-testing activity, which is extremely important, and stating how that um, pilot study improved um, the research uh, process. And I think uh, more and more, we need to really insist that we see um, pilot studies coming out in, in terms of the research process. And checking through and cleaning the data 
uh, ensuring that you know the the data is accurately recorded, uh, the concepts are, are clear and qualitative, and you know the coding process that would go through in qualitative, and also cleaning the data, you know, um, missing data, their, their guidelines, you know, outliers, just getting the data clean, very important um, activities that should be included in the write-up and um, to avoid some of these mistakes. And I just want to um, end um, here by looking at some of the common uh, matters I, I see coming out uh, in a tourism review and other journals um, that I uh, review. Sometimes there are issues with the research design, no research design, um, not clearly explaining exactly systematically what was done in terms of the methods. Um, there is no data types test alignment. So you have non-parametric data and you have parametric tests. Uh, very important. I mean, uh, once you see that, uh, that kind of error, your paper may not um, go through. Um, no mentioning of pilot study or ethical review. Uh, very important um, that that is checked off uh, in terms of getting a paper published. Um, mixed methods or mixture of methods, understanding that whole uh, paradigm of mixed methods is very important if the paper is um, proposing that. Uh, data processing software, I see that. So what did you actually do? Did you actually do it yourself? Um, so that is important as well. And that will come in into the data analysis. And um, no references as to the justification. Are there papers that use similar methods that you need to include to justify that this is tried and tested and strengthen the methodology. And so this is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to the next one, I just want to say, uh, ask a request to our panelists because we have some questions coming from the audience. And if you could read them, and if it's in your part, if you could answer them in writing, that would be really appreciated. And because I, I'm, I'm afraid that at the end, we won't have time to address all of the questions. So if some questions are simple and you can answer them in writing, please feel free to do that under the questions. Thank you. And okay, let's move I'll, on I'll to our... Thank you. So let's move on to our next presenter, Dr. Craig uh, Webster, and we'll discuss the discussion and implications of a manuscript. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for having me, folks. It's really a pleasure to be here. In speaking about this today, um, I see that I'll lose a lot of parallels with what David was saying, with what I'll appreciate. And what I think of this is, is when I think of research, I think of it as sort of like a sandwich, not a Danish one, but a typical sandwich where there's a top and a bottom. And the top and the bottom should resemble each other and they should make you, it's, it's not the juiciest part of the sandwich, but it should be attractive, not stale, and hold things together. Uh, so I, I, I really sort of going out of my way for this, but I was thinking of this as when David spoke, so you'll see some parallels in what he and I say, and I think that's inbuilt into the system, sort of how we usually do this. Next slide, please. So what I when I think about writing um, and and writing up the uh, the paper at the end is I always think about is, is this practical in some way? Uh, there are many interesting questions that are sort of uh, abstract and interesting, uh, but we should always be trying to help practice, I think, um, unless it's a really daunting and massive sort of theoretical issue, which I don't think we often deal with in tourism studies. Uh, uh, so when you write up the implications, I think one of the interesting things to write about is show an example that in, in a case in which it may actually be important. Another thing is that the vague and useless comments like uh, hospitality members should remember the importance of customer service uh, this is not particularly helpful. It, some nuance to that or some uh, something that is applicable, interesting, 
and and sort of insightful would be more pre appropriate. Um, so there's always that linkage of theory and practice, practice, which we should be trying to do. I mean, industrial research, practical, but academic research, which is what we are typically writing on, doesn't have to be. Um, uh, have to be entirely practical. We should have some theory involved in that. Um, and then again, that bottom for the sandwich, that the 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 the, the write up in the in the implications should have something that highlights um, the theoretical importance and is linked with the literature. Again, I do agree with the earlier speaker who is speaking about the question of literature reviews. Many times are too daunting. I think in much of the research that's that's published in academia. Um, that's why I, I always love research notes, because I think research notes are where it's at. It's not massive theoretical stuff, and there are many very interesting findings that we have that haven't really yet been incorporated into theory, and I think that's also good stuff to write and great stuff to read. Um, another thing is the highlighting of innovation. Is the topic innovative? Are the methods innovative? Are the findings surprising or counterintuitive? Um, Otherwise, why just write something that everyone else agrees on a topic that everyone already agrees on um, and you don't have something new or interesting to say? Um, another thing to do is the limitations. Uh, I like mentioning limitations because sometimes when you mention limitations, then it's no longer a weakness. Um, it's a strength that you've noted it and you understand that. Um, and a lot of limitations don't particularly bother me when, when they're mentioned. Uh, for example, data gathering, sometimes resources are limited in what you can gather. You don't have time to do a pilot or resources to do it. I think for me, that's fine. But mentioning that, um, it's a good way to avoid the, the reviewer from mentioning that that is a major limitation. Next slide, please. And then the other thing is showmanship and winning. Uh, and as an earlier speaker said, is if it's if it's just in your head and it's not written, what's the value of it really? Uh, it might be nice for you to walk around and ponder things, but the world needs to see your ideas and your creativity should come out. And as was mentioned earlier, and I think it's really great that in these discussions we see some parallels in what people are saying. I've always been told, don't get it right, get it written, and and I think that's a good way you start. And, you shouldn't be worried about perfection because that doesn't really exist to a large extent. But you have to get your ideas out and then redevelop them and, and rewrite it and rethink it and improve it. Um, another thing about papers, I'm seeing a lot of papers that are, for example, a lot of structural equation models that come out in publications. You have lots of hypotheses. At the end of the paper, you don't even remember what they are because there's too many findings. And what you're looking for when you read is, is there something memorable? Is there insight that you can take out of this paper? And instead of having 12 different hypotheses, and about 11 of them will be statistically significant in the same direction as hypothesized earlier, um, tell us what's interesting or most surprising or most useful about the findings and suggest future looking research and what we can do. Uh, again, the other issue is statistically significant doesn't mean it's significant to a reader. Tell us something interesting and important. Um, finally, I'd like to say, with, you know, make it so people want to read the paper. I read so many dry papers that are not necessarily the most interesting topics, lots of hypotheses, tested, lots of findings. You're not entirely sure what, what's memorable about it or what, what you can use out of it. Add something interesting to it. Your titles can be interesting. Your findings may be interesting and, and bring some thinking about how people can use it. Funny stuff in papers too is also great because I think for me writing a paper, I don't think of myself as a scientist first and foremost. I think of myself as an artist and where there's an empty paper and I fill it up with things. Now the art form I use is academic research, but it's it's an opportunity to be creative and change the world, even in small ways, by changing the way people think, the language people use, the topics people explore, and how people do things in business. Again, the big one is get it published, get it written, and move ahead. And that's all I have, really. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Next, let's... 
my sense of echo. Uh, sorry. Uh, next, let's welcome uh, Dr. Yuli uh, Grizel to talk about the write-up and the revision of the uh, manuscript. Thank you. Can uh, Can you guys hear me? Because I have lost all sound. Okay. Yep. Um, it's going to be uh, an interesting presentation because I cannot uh, really hear myself through the through the system. So let me know if uh, uh, it doesn't work. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the write-up and the revisions. Um, so if uh, you could uh, move on to the slide. Thank you. And I, I already saw that there was a question also from the audience in terms of uh, perfectionism. And uh, I have to um, admit that I'm a perfectionist too when it comes to the writing. So for me, writing is very hard. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for making us do that exercise. Uh, so for some people, this is kind of like the, uh, uh, the cherry on, on uh, um, a cupcake. Uh, for me, it's the real work. Um, the research is is more the fun part, and then uh, really sitting down writing uh, is is something that doesn't come easy to me. So, especially as a perfectionist, and we've heard it from uh, uh, several of the panelists, uh, this can be a problem. Um, but here are some of the things that um, maybe will also um, help you move through and, and help you um, think about uh, things that will make the process easier for you. So um, negotiating and renegotiating authorship. Uh, I have this as my first point, and you might think, how does this affect uh, writing quality manuscripts? Um, what it does as a as a um, reviewer, as an editor, I often see people submitting very disjointed kinds of manuscripts where clearly they've uh, just com uh, completely divided up the work, uh, and no one was in charge in the end. And so I think um, the start of the writing project, if you're not a single author, uh, should be really thinking about. Uh, who's good at writing what, who, who actually has the insights, uh, who did the work, um, who's uh, also maybe more a uh, 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 conceptual uh, person, who's more uh, grounded in the data. And um, uh, in the end, the first author uh, has the uh, obligation to really turn this uh, into a cohesive uh, kind of article, right? And so um, it's not that, you know, um, you can just divide everything. Someone has to, in the end, make sure that everything fits together. Like uh, Craig said, uh, that sandwich um, uh, needs, to, needs to look good <laughs> and needs to taste good. You can't just stuff everything in it um, and, and then expect people to say, oh, wow, that that was, you know, that's great. That makes sense together. Uh, the next thing is um, before you start the writing process, maybe think about uh, your target audiences. And uh, we are doing this webinar for Tourism Review. Um, Tourism Review is a specific journal, right? And it, it has a specific readership. Um, it has specific guidelines. So uh, every journal is a little different. In tourism, we have many journals. So um, they have slightly different uh, flavors. They have slightly different expectations. Um, they have different guidelines in terms of length. Um, they have different opportunities also uh, in terms of types of papers that they will be uh, accepting. So uh, don't just select the journal um, because of I don't know, uh, the citation impact, um, that is important, but uh, also think about, uh, is that the right journal uh, for your paper, for your message? Um, then you are going to have to convince the editor. So uh, Professor Buhalis uh, is your first audience there at the journal um, who's going to um, 
either say yes, this is great, or who's going to uh, desk reject your paper. So the editor is a very bu busy person and um, the editor also needs to kind of think about the journal, right? And what fits with the journal. So you are speaking to that editor. And so uh, beyond uh, the actual manuscript, uh, don't forget to write a cover letter. Sometimes uh, the cover letter and the abstract are the only things that editors will actually look at because they will uh, not have time to read your um, manuscript in detail. So you need to convince them right away with a convincing, persuasive title um, and a good cover letter that really explains what you're uh, trying to do. Then you're writing for reviewers, right? And um, uh, we have this myth out there that reviewers are, you know, very angry people and they want to reject your papers and they're just going to make your uh, life miserable. Uh, but from my experience, uh, reviewers actually really want to see papers published. Um, you are actually making my job easy as a reviewer. If you write a great paper, then I can just say it's great. Um, and we're both uh, done, right, with the process. So um, reviewers don't like dragging out the process either. It's, it, it hurts me uh, personally if I have to reject the paper. Um, as an editor, or if I have to recommend rejection to the editor as a reviewer, um, I'd, I'd rather, um, um, you know, really uh, publish the paper, but, but I also have to protect uh, the readers, right? That's my job as a reviewer. And I have to say, well, if someone reads this paper, they might actually be um, um, getting the wrong idea. Or if someone um, uses your findings, in the industry, they might actually um, be misled, right? And so um, that is the purpose of the review process. So you're writing for reviewers, uh, which means also they are unpaid, uh, they have a lot of work, they have a lot of papers to review, and so this is why you need to be very uh, concise, uh, but also engaging in your writing. And it needs to be uh, clear, um, but also it needs to be something that people get excited about. Um, so keep that in mind uh, for your writing. Ultimately, the readers, right? Who is the audience here? Are you writing for a journal that has practitioners as their audiences? There are some. Um, are you writing a paper for uh, a very particular um, um, audience? And here I would like to address that question of why in tourism, our literature reviews are longer than in the sciences because the sciences are very specialized. And uh, so if you do research on kidneys, that's what you're going to write about and that's what you're going to read. In tourism, we have people coming from many, many disciplines and uh, the literature review is there to educate them. So they don't have to read everything that you have read uh, about this topic, right? So it's a brief um, kind of uh, education for um, the reviewers, the readers um, about the topic. So yes, in tourism, uh, the situation is different. We, we, uh, we have many literatures, we have many um, uh, disciplines, we have many um, uh, regional contexts that we are dealing with. And so we have to address that in our writing. Ultimately, if you want your paper to have impact, impact in the industry, impact um, through media coverage, uh, impact in uh, terms of students finding your papers, uh, other colleagues finding your papers, you also need to write for the search engines and increasingly also for uh, AI, for ChatGPT. So you need to think about your keywords, right? You need to think about uh, also how your topic might be related, like David said, uh, to other uh, topics. And if you could go back to my previous slide, I'm not done yet, um, sorry. All right, so um, writing for these audiences um, is, is important. Overall, um, you need to find a cohesive storyline. A lot of papers, I think, get rejected uh, because they 
do not do that. It is really um, a craft. It is about writing a story. Uh, you need to have convincing arguments. And um, a lot of people really don't know how to formulate an argument. So think about arguments. Every paragraph in your paper needs to be uh, an argument, right? You need to move uh, these arguments forward. And in the end, people will, like in a Hollywood uh, kind of movie setting, will go like, ah, oh, that was great, right? Or there will be some, some sort of, um, um, Build up and conclusion in the end. Um, make sure you stick to the journal guidelines. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, they are not so clear, so make sure that you actually contact the editor if there is a question. Um, I think another problem is that uh, a lot of uh, papers are very boring um, if they only contain um, uh, words and numbers, right? So think about how you present your arguments. Um, is, is it possible to have a graph? Um, and then also um, some of the problems that I see in the writing is that people just list the literature, they do not synthesize. They just present the findings, they do not synthesize the findings. And the same with the contributions, it's kind of like a um, point by point, but in the end, the overall contribution is not um, kind of drawn out. Next slide, please. So should you use AI in this writing process? And uh, so coming back to this uh, perfectionism argument, I found AI very helpful for me, especially if you're someone who um, has a little bit of a writer's block and you don't like staring at a blank page. Um, AI can really help you kind of get something started. So for idea generation, for uh, thinking about ways in which you could formulate um, a topic differently, or um, asking uh, some tool like ChatGPT, um, you know, what are other things that relate to this? Uh, are there topics that uh, I should be considering uh, in connection with my topic here? For those kinds of things, AI is really useful. AI is also useful for grammar and spell checking and formatting, um, but uh, here I would recommend not using ChatGPT. ChatGPT will always try to rewrite, and ChatGPT has a very specific writing style. And so native speakers will immediately be able to tell uh, if something is written by ChatGPT. Um, so you can use Grammarly, you can use Quillbot, there's other tools out there. But also be mindful that this creates expectations. Now, if I get a paper that has a lot of language problems, I actually have no patience for this anymore because there's really uh, no excuse uh, for you. Uh, you don't have to send it to a, a, an expensive editor. Uh, all you have to do is at least run it through one of these tools uh, to get it into a basic shape. Uh, you can also use AI to represent your data in compelling ways. AI is getting much better at uh, helping you at least think about how you could present your data. Um, and, and so in these ways, AI is really useful. But please do not use it for literature reviews. There's some out there, some tools that uh, claim to be okay, uh, that claim to just search actual literature. Um, I have not found them to be very useful. Um, ChatGPT for sure makes up uh, papers, so uh, it will hallucinate. Uh, it's not a, uh, a tool to use. Uh, do not use it for the actual uh, writing, and uh, uh, do not ignore the journal guidelines regarding AI. Some journals now require that you actually uh, uh, write down uh, how you use AI in the process of writing up your paper. Yep. So um, in the end, and I, I think uh, Alan will tell us a little more about this process. Um, uh, so in the revision uh, process of your, your writing, so writing is a long process. It can really spend um, months, sometimes years. Um, it's important to uh, motivate yourself to, to go back to that process. Um, 
And one of the things that you should do is not just read, but reread and maybe reread again uh, the review comments before you actually make changes. Um, actually put yourself in the role of the reviewer. Try to understand why they didn't understand your argument. Try to uh, see what was unclear. Um, if reviewers are contradicting themselves then, and the editor has not uh, commented on this, then please do contact the editor and say, this is really unclear, or I'm not sure how to resolve this because... Uh, questions and answers? I've managed to answer all the questions we had on the chat. Uh, yes, and, and I have some... Sorry, go ahead. And there are lots of questions. Let me say a few things that they're coming from the chat and also they're coming from what we discussed. Um, first of all, uh, we have recently increased the word limit from five and a half thousand words to between six and eight thousand words. And that's because a lot of the qualitative papers was almost impossible to fit within the five and a half thousand words. So that gives us a little bit of more space for people to do. Uh, there's a lot of questions about I'm doing this or I'm doing this context in Africa or in different places uh, or I'm doing this technique or this methodology, would you publish my paper? And the answer to all of that is yes, provided that there's innovation, provided that your paper will uh, be addressing global challenges and will be applicable to different places, we will publish the paper. Um, there are some questions about uh, the speed of how tourism review is publishing papers and that is very much related to the quality uh, if the quality when the paper arrives of good quality first of all it will uh, it will save from desk rejection and second it is probably going to uh, get favorable reviews from the reviewers and then what happens is that there are less uh, rounds of reviewing during this process. So typically tourism review is accepting papers on R4. So it means that there are four, four rounds, meaning that uh, reviewers have got four months more or less to respond to, to the papers but also there are three periods between uh, the, the, the reviewers have sent comments and uh, um, the author is improving the paper to send it in. So if you can, um, if you can do that in a, in a fast way, meaning that if you can respond to the reviewers and improve your paper within the month that we allocate, it means that you'll have probably about six to seven months from uh, from submission to acceptance. But it all depends on how fast you actually can do, uh, can, 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 can improve the paper and what's the quality of the paper. I've accepted the paper on R7, but also I've accepted the paper in R1. So it all depends on, on how good the paper is, is when it comes in. So, uh, what else questions have we had here that I've answered? Um, so, the key thing is really about clarity of the ideas, it's innovation, it's really about does the paper makes a, makes a contribution or not? And, and I think that is the most significant decision that we need to make. Um, about 65 to 70 percent of the papers do not survive my desk. 65 to 70 percent of the papers are desk rejected and I think that is really important to uh, to remember and, and several colleagues talk about these things um, and why they're desk rejected if they are not widely uh, widely applicable, if they do not address the different context, if they are not innovative enough, if they are just written so someone can write another paper, they're not going to survive the first round. And then another 10% uh, to 15% is being rejected on, on, the first, on the first review. 
Um, so it's really important that you submit your best review, the best papers in, that you take care that you are developing the papers, that you make sure that you read tourism review so you understand what's the format. A lot of people have not um, seen the recent papers that they've that they've uh, uh, on on the areas that they are trying to address. So I'm not going to I'm not going to publish something that we've just we've just uh, addressed. So you really authors really need to look into the into the journal, understand what's the latest uh, uh, developments in this area. So this is some quick answers uh, to the issues that I've been responding on 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 the chat. Thank you, Professor Bahadis. Um, I also here have some questions that we received when audience uh, registering uh, when audience registered this webinar. Uh, one thing um, a lot of people are asking when they registered and they are asking today is about a systematic literature review. So they are asking why these type of paper always get reject now on top journals. So uh, can any uh, panelists want to jump in and answer that question, how to write a good systematic literature review paper? I think we, we reject a lot of uh, systematic literature reviews because they are formulae. They're just going through, uh, they're just going through the software. They are creating a few graphs and they make a very, very uh, uh, limited contribution. So you don't have extra new knowledge and that's why uh, often they are rejected. To get to survive uh, in, uh, literature review and systematic review, it really needs to be systematic. You really need to identify key issues. It really needs to make a contribution to knowledge. It really needs to make, to bring things forward. And most of the papers that we see in this category do not, they're quick, quick fixes that they do not make any contribution. I don't know if anybody else would like to take that. Yeah, no, I, mean, I agree, Dimitros, and it goes back to my, my comment about the boilerplate. If it looks standardized, it is standardized. And I, I actually like systematic reviews, but they've got to be good. So that it's no different to any other uh, process. You know, you, the, there are some very, very good ones out there, but if they're quick and dirty, they're very formulaic, as Dimitros mentioned, they're not going to get through because they just hit you really hard as, oh, not another one, okay? But if you're looking for originality, which you can do, there's some systematic review, reviews out there that are really very, very, very strong. So I would counter, no, they're not all rejected at all, but the formulaic ones are. Anyone else want to add on to that topic? Systematic literature review? I, I would, I mean, I agree. I mean. Again, it goes back to that very basic question. Is what you're writing a value to other people and interesting? Would they want to read it? And again, you're right, the boilerplate factory produced stuff is not interesting. Even having an interesting title, that's that's something a lot of people overlook is the title of what they write. It's at many of the times I look at the titles like, oh my God, these people are not creative. It's not interesting. It's not enticing. I'd like to be enticed by a paper. Not bored already from the title. That that is something a lot of people don't know. Most of the most of the papers that we publish in Tourism Review, we've changed the title from the original contribution. So when the first papers arrive, the titles are quite esoteric. They're really difficult to understand what they're saying, and you're really trying to guess what the author has actually said. Very often I need to read the abstract to understand what they really, really want to, to say. And and very often I've got to rewrite an art, a, a, a title for them based on the findings. Because the findings need really to reflect the the title and the title needs to reflect the, the, the findings. And if, if I may add to that's an excellent point Dimitrios just made, 
because I think the literature review, what has really helped me um, is actually writing up the results and findings and then going back to the literature review. So that alignment, the similar alignment with the title of the findings, the literature review sometimes isn't aligned with um, the findings and results, uh, which becomes problematic because then when you get into the discussion now, um, you know, what are you uh, really discussing if your literature didn't, this, you know, didn't consider your findings and results or your hypotheses and so on. I think what is also um, important with literature review is the, the telling of the story, you know, reaching that um, point of climax, well, what it is, uh, that light bulb um, that you are trying to address in, in that paper, that has to come out clear. Whether it is you, you have a conceptual framework, a theoretical framework at the end, what it is at that big um, moment in the literature, it has to lead into that. And sometimes that isn't there. Um, so I, I think authors need to, in summary, probably write your results and findings, then go back into your literature to make sure it's aligned and make sure there is that climax or that big light bulb thing that is coming out in the literature as well. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a lot discussing about this systematic literature review. And I saw there are audience asking about another question, another type of study that's uh, qualitative. So maybe we didn't mention that enough in today's webinar. Uh, so they are asking about um, because usually qualitative studies are, is lack of generalizability because the sample size usually is very limited compared to quantitative. So they are talking about how to write a quality qualitative study um, like an explanatory uh, qualitative study or case study. So how do we publish these kind of um, uh, studies research on top journals? Who would like to take that? Alan? Yeah, uh, I can start that one, Demetrius. Uh, again, I would say there are some wonderful, wonderful qualitative papers out there. I think they are slightly harder to, to, to get approved. I, I, I agree with that. But I think it comes down to writing a qualitative paper is actually hard. And where I learned my craft was actually going outside of tourism. So, and actually it was former colleagues in Bournemouth in the Health Sciences um, College. Go into those subjects where qualitative research is very, very common. And so things like health organizational studies, read those papers and then come back into tourism because in those areas it's very common they're done extremely well the methods are very original and then bring that into tourism um, and, I, and i think the, the good qualitative papers out there are very heavily cited they're interesting they're novel and they tend not to be boilerplate okay but you do need to learn your craft and and writing qualitative papers is hard, but go to those areas, those disciplines where they're far more common, and that's where I learn from. So go to those that really are doing this constantly, yeah. and your craft will be better. But good it's qualitative papers are very highly cited. And ju just to, uh, I won't mention the name of the journal, but uh, Scott McCabe, who's an editor of our other leading journal, he's super supportive of qualitative. As is Demetrius. Yeah, but absolutely. It's got to be good. It's got to be good, and it needs to be relevant to a lot of people. So if it's if it's um, what I call the village of my mother, you know, in a very small place, uh, someone has done some, um, you know, ten interviews that predictably will not be published. Uh, it needs to be, it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to add uh, to theory and to practice and it needs to contribute to the knowledge we have. And can I just add, if you go back to the very early tourism papers of the sort of 1960s, 1970s, they were essentially qualitative papers, anthropology in particular. You know, that, that's where a lot of this started. So it, they're, they're a very, very important part of the academy. So 
don't lose sight of the, the, the overall worth of qualitative papers. Thank you. Uh, Daisy, do you want to add on to it? I know you published quite a lot of qualitative papers. Uh, yeah, maybe just to supplement. Uh, I think um, I think I heard enough from uh, Demetrius about uh, the differences. You're focusing on if small villages from the small specific cases is never going to be, you know, uh, generalizing a lot of uh, implications or why people from other side of the world, they bother reading your paper. Um, so my, my thoughts is about uh, when doing the quality research, um, we're not focusing on like a, a place or an incident or like some small thing. We're talking about a phenomena. Even it's happening in a small village, it's happening in a very rural area, remote areas. Uh, whenever we're uh, uh, like um, talking about the thing, it's, uh, it's um, um, phenomena. It could happen somewhere else on the other side of the world where, who are like facing the similar issues. So it's all about, I think, how we are really telling the story and why we think it's important. And the people from the other parts of the world, they also need to read it. And also, I think I really agree with Alan, the, the impact of the quality research. Uh, I feel that's really, really uh, big. For example, when I'm preparing for my teaching materials, I feel it's quite hard to refer or copy those uh, figures or models from those uh, quantitative SEM, like those um, model things. Students are not really interested in seeing those numbers, but if we're talking about some stories, things happen in some particular places, um, using some of the quality research, students feel that's very, interest very interesting. So I feel uh, the power of quality research is really uh, could be much beyond what we have thought about. Thank you. Any other comments on qualitative research? Yeah, I, I think there's there's the notion that um, major journals don't like it, but I think that's not entirely true. I think a lot of, there are a lot of people that are they're begging for qualitative research, and um, and they're afraid to many times send it to top journals, uh, quality journals, because they think it'll just be rejected, and that's absolutely untrue from my experience. And that's another thing I'd always encourage people: send send things to better journals than you think will touch your stuff, um, because you know worst case scenario it gets it gets uh, desk rejected. Well, maybe. Maybe the worst case scenario is it goes through a review and then gets rejected. But uh, you know, even if it's rejected, you can. And and I've been surprised. I've sent what I thought would definitely get rejected by top journals, and they've gotten accepted. And you know, if you don't try for top journals, you won't publish ever in a top journal. You got to do it, in my opinion. Craig, what Thank is you. behind on your board behind? I'm just trying to. There, there was some. Uh, ah, there was a. Uh, there was some van that came in here last night, and I don't know why they're writing in Greek, but uh, <laughs> say thank you to them. They're doing fine. There's some vandals here. It's terrible, terrible vandalism at Ball State. That's that's <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. <laughs> Well, thank you, and I think we have time for just the last final comments for our audience, uh, especially for those uh, junior researchers. They uh, uh, they really want to publish on top journals, and some are asking, "Oh, now we are we are publishing on like a Q3, Q4 journals. How could we improve our work to be published on Q1 journals?" So, any final comments? Your um, anything you think is most valuable for them, please go ahead, everyone. Uh, let's start with uh, Benny first, please. Can she hear us? Oh, sorry, I think I'm she not sure if she can hear. Probably still okay, not. Then, then start with Michelle, then, please. Okay, um, thank you, uh, CC. I just want to encourage everyone to write and write and write. And uh, don't uh, be afraid of putting it out there. 
uh, even if you are uh, writing for your thesis or if it's an article, uh, just put it down and uh, get it going. I know that's probably the hardest part of it to get going with the writing. Um, so that's my encouragement for you today. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, oh, Yuli just joined us. Can you hear us? Yes, I can finally hear you again. <laughs> I don't know what happened. So we are sharing the final advice, the most valuable comment for the young researchers for their work to be published on top uh, top tier journals. Anything you want to share as your last comment, please? Yes, um, I, I think it's important to try. It's important to um, uh, maybe if you're really unsure what to do to uh, uh, ask uh, if someone would like to collaborate with you so that you are not alone going through this process. Uh, maybe, um, you know, as senior scholars, to be honest, uh, are usually very friendly. Yes, they're busy, but um, um, ask them if you have a specific question. Um, there is uh, something called a friendly review. Um, so they, they might not want to be involved in actually writing the paper with you, but they will say, hey, yes, sure, I'm, I'm happy to look at your um, methods section and give you some comments real quick. So please reach out. Hello, hello uh, everyone, I cannot hear you, I'm alone. sorry. I only, <laughs> since Misha's presentation, I couldn't hear anybody. I'm so sorry. Okay, Yuli, continue. Oh, I I just said uh, you don't have to um, figure this out all by yourself. Um, uh, you know, I think editors as well as uh, other scholars in the field. Uh, this is the beauty of tourism. Um, I'm usually very um, happy to give you comments and feedback. So do reach out. Thank you, Yuli. Uh, let me text Benny and see if she can just share her last um, final advice. Can you hear us now, Benny? I don't think she can hear, but she can talk. This is, can I offer just one final thought? It's jumping on what Uli's just said. Always share your work with colleagues before you submit. Or get a sense check. So there may not be reviewers, but just Get get a second opinion. Don't don't hide it to, to yourself because sometimes you miss really obvious things because you're so close to paper you just Can don't you see yourself. So always share with a colleague or a trusted okay, friend. My final advice. My final advice is, uh, I think we for as a researcher we focus on methodology. Uh, finding and discussion, discussion session, sections more than introduction and literature review. We write a lot of stories about our research and add a lot of information, unnecessary information in introduction and literature review. So my brief suggestion is let's keep our introduction and literature review section brief and short and clear and focus on more methodology because methodology is very important. We see what researchers are trying to do, what type of uh, research they are conducting and their participants, their um, surveys, their questions, their experimental methods. Sometimes researchers write one or one and a half page methods, which is not clear and a lot of <clears throat> figures, tables, a lot of numeric data. It's kind of show off of the paper, but the results are very brief and sometimes repeat the other research. Discussions are very brief. They repeat the other uh, research or research papers. So we need to focus on methodology, results and discussions and probably in, in, uh, implications as well, more than introduction and long literature review. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Ellen, please go ahead. Sorry for interruption, she can't hear us. 
Yeah, no, just to repeat, Michael, I think it's really, really important before you submit, always share your paper with a trusted friend to sense check because you, you get so close to paper, you've spent weeks on it. Sometimes you miss the really obvious point. So always sense check it before you submit. Everybody needs a trusted friend. Thank you. Craig? I, yeah, I have one final thing. That is, uh, what I find is there's also some discussion about, well, your guidelines for publication, they say 5,000 words or 4,500 words. I think you get caught up in these details. And I, I don't think most, most editors would really care if they say it should be about 5,000 words for a research note, and you, and you send in something that's 5,321. I, I don't think this will be a reason to reject something outright. So I, I think getting caught up with the specific things, I mean, you should try to format correctly and all that, but these details may not matter more than you think that they matter. Yeah, but if it's if it's if it's six if it's um nine thousand words or ten thousand words, it's rejected yeah. or it goes back, and and I have to tell you that a lot of the papers have gone back because of this reason because we have a budget to work to. Okay. Thank you, Daisy. Okay, hey, so um, if to conclude for the um, early career researchers, I think um, writing and the publication is a process. Uh, sometimes we need to be a little bit patient to for, for our styles to, to be improved. Uh, I think we also need to make efforts to uh, in, enable us to reach the, a better status. So uh, sometimes, uh, for example, uh, being all right is not good enough. Uh, we need to be the gatekeepers for ourselves. We need to reach what we think is really good. Otherwise, sometimes, you know, maybe constrained by the structure, by the environments, especially young people, they have the pressure to publish. Sometimes they know what is good, but sometimes they, they have to compromise or to sacrifice something to, you know, to exchange for, for, for the survive, survive. So I think sometimes we need to be just a gatekeeper for ourselves. Yeah. Thank you, Daisy. So I'll pass it on back to Professor Bohalis to give a final closing comment. First, before you do that, what's your final thoughts out of all of this? Okay, uh, very quickly, thank you. I think my f uh, final comment would be reading. So read uh, articles published on top journals, because if you want to publish on top journals, you have to know what has been published there. So read. Uh, at least every week you have to read one or two. That way you learn what has been published there. You know the writing st styles so you can try to improve your paper to be like one of them. That's a very good point. And this was one of my three points, but I said, read the tourism review. Before you try to publish in tourism review, make sure that you read the tourism review. And I think there are two things really that's really critical here. One is think before you write. I know that a lot of people are under pressure to write three papers, five papers, six papers, uh, five papers in the, uh, 15 papers in five years and all the rest of it. But think before you write and think about why am I writing this? Why would someone, and I, and I, I ask people often, would you spend 200 pounds and half a day reading the paper that you have just uh, written? What is the investment that you would have made to actually get the knowledge and the benefit of reading your own article. And if you were not willing to spend half a day and 200 pounds, it's not worth publishing. So think before you write. And the second thing is really evaluate, is this really new and is it significant? And because we still have almost 300 people still with us after two hours i'll give them the biggest secret of my job as an editor and what makes something goes to reviewers or something goes to rejection 
and that's the question is it new and is it significant and is that going to make a contribution to knowledge and to society because if it doesn't make a contribution to knowledge and society it's not worth publishing so for those of you who are still with us and there are several people that, that I understand from the type of the questions that they ask is that they're, they're seeing that in a mechanical way. I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll publish it. It doesn't work like that. It's really about thinking deep about would that make a contribution? Would that help society? And is this new? Or is that, is that something that a lot of people have done in a lot of different contexts? And I think that is really, really critical. And now we've got Daisy's son passing by. I think it's about time to call it the day and say thank you very much to everybody for doing this. Uh, all the panelists, uh, Gary, Tete, and Daisy for organizing this. And um, thank you so much for all of you who have stayed with us for so long having this conversation. The next webinar, Ted, <laughs> Gary, you're still, uh, <laughs> what time is it? One o'clock in Malaysia. And William, thank you so much, guys. You need to go to bed. Eh? Have some ice cream before you go to bed. Okay. That is, that is your, that is your, uh, that's your treat for tonight. Have some ice cream and go to bed. Okay. So thank you very much. So when is the next one, Ted? Eh? It's going to be in June sometime. We have not decided the date yet, but it's going to be in June. And then we'll send out the email it will, after we decide all the details. Fantastic. And that time it will be more Asian time and we'll get Tetsu to wake yes. up and stay until very late. And then uh, Gary and William will be on a, on a daytime. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you. Really thank appreciate you. it. Goodbye. Thank, thank you, you so much. Papers, keep reading the tourism review. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And cut. <laughs> do we do cut? Thank you, guys. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing all that and stay all night for those of you. Craig, very good. Uh,